Live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker. Kegro in a morning show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Monday, November 26, 2018. We're back in the present after a, uh, well, I guess an unpleasant jaunt into the past. Uh, I got to mention, uh, I don't know. I don't know whether I really have to do it first of all, but I might as well do it. Rebecca Romans, who, uh, by the way, if you're having difficulty finding her for some reason on Twitter, she doesn't tweet as Rebecca Romans. She is Rebecca Romans, but tweets as lambs and beds. So make sure you find her in the uh, right location uh, so that you can share in this, well, mild complaint. Uh, just to basically, I mean, don't know if I need to read through it word for word, but basically unhappy about having had uh, a rerun from before the 2016 election played on Friday. And I can understand and sympathize with it. Some people find it interesting, uh I mean, I'm sure everybody finds it relatively interesting, but yeah, like you, there are a few people that probably find it depressing. It's sad to sort of feel through the show. Uh, well, the sorts of stories we paid attention to were different because our problems were different. And I guess, well, she did uh, say outright it was so depressing. She actually had to turn the show off. Which was difficult. It's too bad. I hope you have. Uh, I hope you'd heard that show before, though, because if you did turn it off, you missed a great story toward the end. I actually chose it uh, for that reason. I wanted to replay that story once or twice. Uh, crazy, but very interesting story about uh, someone's research into the uh, post Civil War South and the way their uh, what had previously been their aristocracy, and I guess still was their aristocracy, dealt with. The peculiar institution, as they like to call it, <clears throat> that being slavery, and uh, sort of the forgotten, maybe-ish side. I mean, it's not we've totally forgotten it. It's, it's rarely discussed, but it comes up certainly more often among people who are relatively honest about the effects of slavery. Uh, but the uh, less discussed aspect of slavery which really for for large plantation owners and slaveholders was that they also took advantage of employing their slaves not as laborers or not just as laborers but also as sex slaves and uh almost all of the members of that sort of our southern aristocracy uh, as the uh, the article we read points out had uh the uh well, the offspring of their, uh, the result, I guess, of their of their having raped their slaves, running around and reminding them of it, uh, and literally running around in the backyard. It was just that that amazingly crazy combination of racial hatred and discrimination slash living in close proximity with your slaves slash actually realizing that they were human beings but doing nothing to actually further that realization other than rape them but then uh they they were they were proud of themselves for doing as much as feeding and to some extent educating their children in their backyards of their plantation it was it was a nutty it was a nutty, crazy time, ladies and gentlemen. It was, it was a hell of a story, and I really wanted to share it one more time because uh, I can't believe how disgusting that was and how, how hidden from view that still is today, even when we are relatively honest about slavery. That just never comes up. That's a pretty uncomfortable aspect of the story. So anyway, I wanted to share that again. But yeah, I can absolutely sympathize with you, Rebecca, in uh, in, in realizing just how depressing it can be to listen to our carefree selves from pre-2016 election. Anyway, Greg Dworkin, who is carefree still to this day, uh, is ready to join us and help round up another another crazy weekend. And uh, in our morning tweets from uh, Bill in Portland, Maine, and of course from the mighty OCD, we uh, were reminded just how crazy it was and, and how it wound up 
that whole wacky weekend uh, ended up with, uh, well, uh, we're tear gassing babies, ladies and gentlemen. So it's not enough that we're keeping them in cages. Now the ones who haven't made it to the cages yet get tear gassed at the border. It's, uh, it's a rough, it was a rough weekend. There was a lot of badness happening. And, uh, well, Greg will be here. Well, he is here to help round it up. But it's not, it's not your job to only bring us the bad stuff, Greg. Don't, I'm not going to put it all on you. Well, thanks. Okay. Tell us something good. How was your turkey? I don't know. How's that? Oh, turkey was fine. Oh, Family's great. Uh, the weather, it's like 39 degrees, and therefore it's not freezing. So I suppose there's always good in the world. But, you know, there's a bunch of crises happening here. Yes. Uh, the pundit roundup that I put together this morning is mostly about election and election aftershocks. We still have California 21 account. And, of course, we have uh, Mike Espy running yes. off against uh, the Dixiecrat uh, Cindy Hyde-Smith running as a Republican in Mississippi tomorrow. Yes. Okay. So uh, your stories about Mississippi, the South, aristocracy, ah, yeah. I mean, they're, right. they're actually uh, fairly relevant. Dang. Uh, Cindy Hyde-Smith, it turns out like many people in Mississippi, went to a segregated academy to avoid integration and send her daughter there, too. Yeah. And it's just incredible that the racism is just so open. Yeah, this particular they, election, thanks to Donald Trump, it's it's a you know she's a neocon, as Max Boot points out, but not is like she? he's a neocon. <laughs> she's a neo confederate. <laughs> okay, yeah, I don't know whether they necessarily go hand in hand, but uh... the neocons are back, he says, but hmm. not me, them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I can understand that. Uh, they're they're. Yeah. Insane. Actually, kind of a cute turn of phrase there for him. Yes. All right. I mean, uh, who would expect that from Max Boot, which is a totally real name? Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, we have that. Um, there are three crises going on right now simultaneously, not all of which are Trump's doing, all of which he's had some hand, more or less, mm -hmm. of being worse. We have, of course, the uh, crisis on the border which has been elevated to crisis from political stunt because he fired tear gas at babies in diapers and yes. people with cerebral palsy who couldn't get out of the way. Yes, and over but, the border at that. Over the border. And we have um, uh, the Brexit crisis. Right, yes. In the UK, the European Union, European Union leaders approved the Brexit plan. So now it goes to the British Parliament where everybody hates it and everybody hates Theresa May. And so it'll be uh, of interest oh. uh, to see how that plays out. She's managed to annoy everybody. The hard Brexit, pro-Brexit people are annoyed because uh, they're still subject to EU and they're going to lose a lot of money. And uh, Theresa May still lying about this and says, no, 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 it's all good. And if we do this, we'll have more money for the National Health Service, which was the big lie that got elected in the first place and turns out not to be true. And, of course, the people who don't want to do Brexit at all are unhappy because they just want a new referendum. So this may bring down our government. We'll have to watch that. Okay. And then we have uh, Russia stopping Ukrainian ships in the Black Sea or to get access to the Black Sea. Uh, and so there is an elevated uh, uh, crisis between the Ukraine and Russia, uh, which may quickly get uh, out of control. And uh, how does Trump have anything to do with it? He didn't cause any of it. He didn't cause uh, violence in Doris uh, and, and other countries uh, on the, uh, that are forcing uh, women and children to go north. Uh, nor did he uh, force Mexico to uh, act in any way, shape, or form. As a matter of fact, he announced there was a deal with Mexico, the Mexican government, oh, yeah. the incoming one agreed to keep all of the uh, caravan people on that side of the border while they apply for asylum. Of course, the only problem with that is that the new government doesn't take effect till Saturday, and they said they had nothing to do with this, and there is no deal. Oh, yes. Uh, the the weekend was marked, in in my view, by the announcement of probably a half a dozen things by the White House, all of which are not true and don't exist in many cases. Right. Uh, you know, and, and they're they're doing a, a gish gallop, I guess. You do so many different uh, weird lies that you hope that even Daniel Dale can't keep up. 
Hmm. That's a yeah. That's the measure by which you would, uh, uh, well, measure. That's a terrible use of the word because now I'm stuck with it twice. Measure your success. If you can baffle Daniel Dale, you've really done something. Well, Daniel Dale has pointed out that the uh, number of lies has increased exponentially. So uh, we have that. We still have uh, waiting on Mueller. Mm. The idea there being that uh, Mueller gave Trump the uh, courtesy of uh, asking a bunch of questions and Trump then replied to them. And then Mueller waited for the replies to be delivered back before Thanksgiving. That's been done. Now that he has the replies, he gets to do moves, whatever moves he wants. Mm -hmm. He can subpoena Trump. He can ask for more. He can ask for a, court, uh, a, a personal interview. He can just go ahead and indict people. We don't know what he's going to do next, but uh, everybody's kind of waiting on that. And that, and that is uh, one of those uh, known unknowns that's been hanging out there for so long that people even are starting to discount it in the sense that I don't know when he's going to do anything. So I'm just going to go ahead and plan 2020 as if none of this exists. And, of course, the Mueller um, situation so and his work product clearly exist and will have major impact. What's also interesting, if you've been following this, is that Cambridge Analytica may have been involved with the Brexit vote. I, so <laughs> there may be yeah. some parallels here between what happened with Brexit, Nigel Farage, and, and uh, what happened in the U.S. Uh, with Roger Stone and whether they com uh, communicated or not and whether it was the same Russian uh, uh, troll farm at all who was driving that process. So hmm. uh, it'll be quite interesting to see what Mueller does and, and what he uh, reveals and whether or not it has anything to do with one of these crises. So uh, that's the, the Trump connection with Brexit, even though he didn't cause Brexit. And then as far as the he Ukraine so. and, uh, and uh, Russia crisis, that's Ukraine, but the Ukraine crisis, uh, you know, mm. it's, it's uh, pretty clear that uh, Trump has no interest whatsoever in sanctions against uh, Putin and Russia. Oh, no way. Since he may owe them a whole bunch of money. We don't know. We have to wait for Mueller on that. And uh, again, he didn't cause Russia to want to expand and get territory. They've been doing that for hundreds of years. But his uh, weak and ineffectual response uh, certainly isn't helping. I didn't even know that he had a response to even label weak and ineffectual and ineffectual. But did he say something? Anything? Uh, well, you know, Google what is appeasement. <laughs> yes, but that's... You used to get references to 1940. Now you just get pictures of Donald Trump. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, uh, I mean, it's as close as you can get to causal. I'm not saying his but... middle name is Neville. I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> it may be. All right. Well, uh, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a very weird weekend. And uh, I mean, at this point, we're just, I guess we're, we're used to it, which is a terrible thing. There's international crises all over the place. And we're used to the fact that Trump is glued to the television or playing golf. Well, there's other problems, too. Uh, oh. Yes, that's true. We don't have a uh, leadership in the U.S. to respond. We don't have a U.S. response. But we also have Angela Merkel being a lame duck, Emmanuel Macron being not particularly popular. Uh, Theresa May racked with this Brexit stuff, uh, distracting her from the world stage as if she has any experience there anyway. So uh, what's the response supposed to be from Europe? I mean, it's kind of muddled. And, and you know, we have uh, the uh, the Hungarians and others who are uh, basically on the side of fascism. Uh, oh. And so it's uh, it's scary. It's a scary world out there. Uh, well, just but then like again, you know, you. before the 2016 election, since you did that uh, – a podcast on Friday, uh, I would point out that we pointed out before the 2016 election, and one of the reasons it was so important is that uh, Donald Trump, the eventual winner, uh, had no skills and no interest in learning skills yes, uh, when it comes to handling crises like these, which were inevitable because, again, it's a dangerous world. And one of the things we've learned about Donald Trump, we knew he was unqualified. But the degree to which he was uninterested in even attempting to learn anything uh, was actually, I think, uh, the one surprising thing even to us who thought he was unqualified from the get-go. Hmm. We thought he'd at least try. Uh, it turns out he doesn't. Yeah, he doesn't well, go to Arlington. Not. He doesn't go to uh, cemeteries when he visits Europe. He doesn't care. 
Uh, he golfs and he watches TV, and that's about all he does. Yes, pretty much. Um, I didn't want this job, but if he can give it to me, I'm just going to do it the way I did my old job. Right. Uh, though, you know, he went out of his way to promise that he wouldn't. He, it turns well, he out lied, he but then again, yeah. he lies every day. He lies every time he opens his mouth. Pretty much. So, okay. Uh, nothing new in that respect, but we do have to, you know, recap all of this nonsense. Keep we do. Day. And, and, you know, part of the problem is that these are ongoing stories with no resolution yet. So oh. I can't tell you how it's going to turn out in any of those cases. Uh, we need a lot more information from what's going on in the border. We know uh, things aren't good there. He keeps threatening to close down the entire Mexican border, which is impossible. Mm-hmm. And then again, there's a government shutdown coming, and he wants yes. money for the wall. Right. And so uh, I presume Fox is going to Fox News is going to uh, you know play whatever happened over and over and over in slow motion, and then uh, add things to the video and say, "Look, they're invading us. We have to have that money for the wall." Yes. That won't work any more than it worked for the November election which is still ongoing. Mm-hmm. California 21 is still not completely counted, and we might wind up winning that one. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's it's all going to feed into the uh, paranoia that he's going to try to push. The interesting thing, though, is that it it doesn't work. I mean, it makes things div- divisive, divisive. It, it makes things difficult. But uh, as uh, someone pointed out, there was a poll in October done by PRRI, uh, which had the following nugget in it. It's right at the very, very end of the pundit roundup today. Okay. 46% of Americans said they not only disapprove of Trump, but there's nothing Trump could do to change their minds. Hmm. That was before this election, this October, not 2016, but 2018. Uh, okay. By comparison, 14, 14% of Americans said they approve of the president and there's nothing he could do to lose their support. Okay. That's and the lovely. point I'm making is how small 14% is. Yes. We talk all the time about, oh, we have to find the Trump voters. These Trump voters haven't changed, and nothing can change their mind. We found them in diners. We found them in, in Burger Kings. It's a tiny percentage of the population. 14%, one four percent Yeah. So I suppose even if we won them over, there wouldn't be much... Well, there's no point in even rally. trying. These are the rally voters. And, you know, if I told you that 86% of the population happened to oppose X, you'd say, well, that's not very popular. Oh, yeah. But usually. for some reason, 14% of Americans say they approve of the president and there's nothing he could do. And we have to spend all of our time writing about it. Yes. Though it is sort of sad to say, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 what percentage of the country would be persuaded let's say, not to support Donald Trump if he were a confessed mass murderer. And, and, and the answer is not 100%. And that's it's disconcerting. It is. But, you know, uh, the, the whole thing is not to overly do Trump support. He's uh, actually so. uh, not doing particularly well. So there's a when it comes to politics, and he's not supporter. doing well in terms of public support. And yes, he's got his 42, 43 percent support, the tribal stuff. But that's not enough. You know, Bill Sher had an interesting uh, map. You can find the map on the list I oh, sent you. It's okay. the red and blue map of the United States, but the state's all outlined. And what he did is he said if the 2020 Electoral College matches the 2018 House popular vote, it would look like this. Mm-hmm. Democrats getting 296 electoral votes and Republicans 242. That is to say 270 to win. But the Democrats, if you just went on the House vote, hmm. uh, would win handily. OK. That's and that handy. election was just a few really? short days ago. So the idea that, oh, well, you know, Trump is a lock. He's a shoe in. You know, he's the favorite. Hmm. Um, Trump is actually doing fairly poorly politically. And it's a point I don't think can be made enough. Why is that important? Because a lot of what Trump does, and and I I point this out in the pundit roundup, this isn't triumphalism. It's what the analysts are saying, and it's actually incredibly important because Trump's message to white rural voters isn't just 1950s-style racism and repression. It's that he can win doing that. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't win doing that, then the rest of it falls apart. Ah. Well, uh, I hope it starts soon. Uh, well, you know, it already started in uh, uh, oh. this last November election. I guess that that's, that's why true. the Democrats took the House back uh, by by record numbers, by, you know, some measures. Uh, again, they they got if you're looking at 
the vote and take it as opposition to the other party, the presidential White House party. Why would you do that? Uh, you know, essentially, right. the Democratic popular vote is going to be 96 percent of what Trump got in 2016. That's mm. just unheard of. Yes. Well, as, as a dry run goes, it worked pretty well. That's true. Well, well uh, if the election were held today, it's our, our favorite phrase it doesn't really mean anything but well, if the election a long were held to today then this would be tuesday but actually it's oh, monday right. so uh no that would be crazy be that's just that's nuts why would you it's gotten it, it's gotten so bad that even dan monday. boss noticed mm. <laughs> in the washington post here well, I'm says, early voting, you know, maybe that's, yes. david broder's successor mm. house results underscore what's good for trump isn't so good for the gop that's the title of the piece yeah. and it's true yeah okay when Donald Trump won the White House in 2016, he did it by hijacking the Republican Party. Now, after what happened in the midterm elections, it's clearer than ever that the president's fortunes and his party's future are at odds. During the final weeks of the fall campaign, Trump put the Republican Party on his back, ensuring the elections would become even more of a referendum on his performance in the typical midterms. And as a result, the Republicans paid a hefty price with potentially longer term implications. That is to say, they lost the suburbs. Yes, Republicans added to the narrow majority in the Senate. Now, this is a map that was the best in generations, and they were hoping to pick up 10 seats. They picked up two. And we got another election tomorrow where uh, Cindy Hyde-Smith and, and uh, Mike Espy are running off. And yes, the odds favor Republicans, but, uh, you know, count the vote first, and then we'll talk about what the outcome was. So right. that came by reinforcing what already is the party's greatest strength, Trump with his rallies, maximize support in solid red states, especially among voters in rural areas and small town communities. But the Trump-centric strategy backfired spectacularly in the race for control for the House as suburban voters revolted against the president. What a revolt in development. Hmm. Delivering a rebuke to his party's candidates in district after district, Democrats have gained 39 seats in the House with the possibility of hitting 40, depending upon the outcome of the still uncalled election in California's 21st district. If the enthusiasm for Trump in rural and small town oh. America constituted the story after 2016, the revolt against him in the suburbs led by female voters has become the story of the 2018 elections. The more you analyze the House results, the more the GOP suburban problem stands out. And they also made inroads compared to Hillary Clinton in 2016 in some of the uh, exurban and rural areas, too. So there's been slow erosion of Trump support. And, uh, you know, when you look at party support for Trump, the party has shrunk a little, but uh, the party support for Trump has shrunk a little as well. And given that he won a razor thin election, uh, you know, subtraction doesn't get you as much as addition does True. and you know he's just not in good position for 2020 uh which is why people like john Kasich and uh, jeff flake make noises about somebody should primary him each pointing at the other uh but those noises wouldn't even happen uh if he were just uh, doing incredibly well or even mildly well it just it really doesn't well. happen among members of the same party to, to to primary an incumbent president is not a typical thing to say the least it does it has happened it's not a particularly republican thing and and uh, it, you know it's been sort of an unspoken republican policy so, well since reagan spoke it i guess so it's not unspoken at all but uh, well, uh, yeah, and yet no one quite has the nerve to say they're doing it. It's early yet, and uh, I, I guess if his support stays in the basement, somebody will eventually begin to say they're doing it for the good of the party. Yeah, something like that. They'll find a sacrificial limb. So the way Boss looks at this is he uses uh, uh, City Lab data. Hmm. And he says, one way of looking at the House results is by population density of congressional districts. So you can have a continuum of six categories ranging from pure rural to pure urban. And in between are four categories of suburban districts yes. from less dense to more dense. So pure rural and then four and then pure mm -hmm. urban. So those are the extremes. And if you look at the 10, well, if you take the 11 most rural districts that were on the competitive list, yes. Republicans held nine of the 11. That means they lost two. Okay. When the new Congress assembles in January, uh, going into the election, Republicans held nine of the eleven. When the new Congress assembles, they'll still hold eight of the eleven. So they lost one. All right. 
Right. They lost one. Okay. But that means that just being in a rural area doesn't make you invulnerable. True. True. If he okay. losses in the next category, the suburban rural districts were also modest. Seven of 19 changed parties, five shifting to the Democrats, two to the Republicans. So mm. the Republicans had 17 of those districts going into the election and will end up either 13 or 14. Probably 13 because we're going to win California 21. And then the damage grows exponentially. The 30 districts categorized as suburban sparse heading into the election. Republicans held every one of them. And now the Democrats have 16 to the GOP's 14. Oh, oh okay. So. so that's where the big pickups were. In the 15 sparse. districts described as suburban dense, something similar happened. <laughs> Republicans held all 15. Mm -hmm. And that, in January, they'll just have three. And the Democrats right. will have 12. So remember, when we're talking about dense, we're not talking about the voters in terms of their heads. We're talking about uh, population density. It's like they have dents in their head? No. You, you can make the case that, you know, the dense voters don't seem to pay attention to anything. But oh. that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about how many people live there. Okay. And the fact of the matter is that if you increase the density of your area by population, you're more likely to vote Democratic. Okay. okay. That's probably exposure to other people. Right. Well, good. So given the closeness of the results in the governor's races, anal yes. analysis suggests Trump can still win states like Wisconsin by running up his margins in rural areas. But Trump's appeal bought, brought a rebuke from voters in the suburbs. And so, you know, the people in the suburbs turn out, and they did in 2017 in Virginia, which you know well, and 2018. Yes. Trump loses. All right. Well, we can do that. And uh, uh, it's, it's easier, I guess, since the denser the district, uh, the, the better the results for Democrats. It's a good thing. as You don't even have to bring out quite as high a percentage where it's denser. So, yeah, and you also something. know where to look right. for votes. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Or read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the k in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Greg Dworkin still with us after our brief break and still recapping the weekend that was. Weekend that was terrible. Weekend that was everything. Well, uh, I can't recap the weekend to be because it hasn't happened yet. Uh, no, we can't recap. But we can predict what will happen. Uh, not oh, very suppose. well, but we could give it a shot. So uh, we were talking a little bit about how Maybe the Democrats made day. their gains in the House, which yeah. is to say... Uh, by winning areas that are more populated. The denseness of the population was uh, yeah. semi-predictive in terms of how Democrats would win. So Me they too. take the urban areas, they lose the very sparse rural areas. But the in-betweeners, the, the more dense the population, the better the Democrats did. But hmm. there's a warning about that. It appears in the upshot this morning okay. under the title, The Suburbs Are Changing But Not in all the ways liberals hope, Lily Geismer, there is this idea that if all these suburban areas are blue, that'll mean they're automatically more progressive, said Lily Geismer, a historian at Claremont Mechanic College in California. Mm -hmm. And she's studying Orange County and other areas like it. There's an indication of something more progressive, but underneath there's still commitments to a lot of kinds of inequality. And for example, um, her research on suburban Democrats, and this will be familiar to a lot of people, certainly true with the hipsters in New York. Mm -hmm. Her research on suburban Democrats identified many who supported liberal agendas in Washington while opposing affordable housing or school desegregation in their own communities. You know, NIMBY, not in my backyard. Okay, yeah. That dissonance reflects a particular politics of many suburban communities, politics that have made them a national battleground. So the Democrats are growing more 
dominant in the suburbs. But if you're going to vote on individual issues, like looking at Orange County, for example, in California, um, you know, the, the, the mayor, the Democratic mayor may have actually won Orange County, which is kind of remarkable, but only by like two votes. Um, but uh, down the ballot in Orange County, voters opposed bonds to fund housing assistance programs, which passed statewide. They rejected a rent control measure by a wider margin than the rest of the state, and that measure failed. So Orange County is not exactly, as she says, as they say in the upshot, on its way to becoming liberal San Francisco. So um, more progressive, but not as progressive as other areas, becomes important when you elect people like Connor Lamb. Okay. And that, in turn, has implications for, oh, I don't know, voting for uh, San Francisco's Nancy Pelosi. I suppose that vote happens Wednesday. So uh, if you're going to win with Democrats in these uh, newly blue areas, chances are you're going to have some blue dogs who were elected. And that's just part of the measure of what happened. You run candidates that fit the district and then those candidates win. And then it turns out they're not as progressive as you want. And so you get letters saying, OK, I won by promising not to vote for Nancy Pelosi. Now, some of them will renege and vote for her anyway. Some of them will vote present. But the dynamic of running against Pelosi was set by the election, not necessarily by ageism, sexism, etc. Mm, okay. That's the point I'm trying to make here. I am willing to accept that point. And, and Pelosi is a good vote counter. She's the kind of leader that says, OK, I need 16 votes. You 15 people can uh, vote against me, and that's fine. And I'll rank them. Yeah. By importance to your own election, mm -hmm. and you get a pass, you get a pass, you get a car, you get a pass, you get a pass, you get a car. You have to vote for me. Tough yes. you. Right. Well, sometimes people have hard jobs right from the beginning. Yeah, that's but that the, is a uh, job, and she does it really well. And we're about the other to see part it. of the vote counting is uh, you can if you can count votes, you can also count the number of votes you don't need. That I mean, the main usually people are are worried about. Well, how many votes do you do you need? Uh, well, you know, but the the answer also reveals the number you don't need. And and uh, she's very adept not only at finding out what is that number, but at approaching members and saying, listen, I understand you feel you need this. I can give it back to you because I've counted. And, uh, you know, some people like uh, end the work at the counting. And uh, those aren't the, the most successful or longest lived leaders of all. Did we say longest live? How would we even put that anyway uh that's what keeps you in power the ability not only to count those votes but to use that data to one to survive and two to help other people survive and then to ask them now that i've given you you know i've done you that favor uh what have you done for me lately right you know when people talk about uh, playing 90 dimensional chess or whatever term they use uh but the one uh practitioner who actually does that is uh, Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. So there you go. Good job. Good job. All right. Well, we're going to keep this uh, segment today fairly short. Uh, unfortunately, i got to scoot off to work. There's the post-holiday uh, stuff going on, so I'm going to say goodbye. Oh, uh, right. But this is Greg Dworkin speaking to my good friend uh, David waldman Kegro in the morning. And uh, we'll be back Wednesday, and yes. we'll have the results of Mississippi to talk about, and we'll have a bunch of other stuff to talk about, too. Okay. So I'll see you then. Very good. And by then, uh, yeah, I guess Wednesday you mentioned, is that right? Is that the caucus vote on uh, making uh, the nomination? I think it's Wednesday. Okay. Well, we'll know by then. I did see uh, flashing by. I guess there's another name of another anti-Pelosi Democrat who is, uh, I guess, jumping off of the bandwagon and, and saying they'll consider uh, providing votes on the floor after all. And which one is that? I don't know. I'll have to go catch that one. I saw it fly by, and it flew by so fast that I didn't get to click on the link that will tell me what the answer is rather than just telling me. We need to save you a click guy right. back. And by the way, uh, because of all of the crisis, the three crises we were talking about, mm -hmm. <clears throat> election analysis, worries about or concerns about or interest in the election of Nancy Pelosi as the next speaker, mm -hmm. We didn't even have time to talk about the environmental blockbuster report that was released on Friday, right. basically saying that the uh, 
uh, trajectory is such that in 10 years, the uh, U.S. economy is going to contract by 10, 11 percent if we don't do anything. That sounds bad. Uh, and they spent all weekend saying how bad it would be for the economy if we did something. No. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the campfire in uh, California is pretty much contained, so at least that's there's good. that. But uh, that, that's a huge story in and of itself that we didn't really have time to go mm. over today. So I'll leave you with Many something stories. and with anything else you want to do Okay. after all, it's your show. And I'll but tell you I'll talk to you on Wednesday. All right, very good, and I won't even make you wait. It's Stephen Lynch. Yay. <laughs> okay, Thank so you. there you go. I uh, got that answer in there for you, and now you, can, you won't be uh, scratching your head all day wondering who it was and upset. Right. Now you can pay attention to patients. You know how it goes. You know how it goes. All right. Okay. Take care. Very good. Thank you. We'll see you on Wednesday. And uh, let's see what we can follow. Well, might as well follow up on this this news. Uh, it was uh, it was Josh Marshall tweeting around the latest from TPM. Another Dem eases up on opposition to Pelosi ahead of key test vote. And I, I always find that a weird formulation, test vote. I, I don't really... Uh, I don't approve of the language, but that's okay. Anyway, Nicole Lafond reporting this, who gave her a little extra Frenchification in it, Lafond, even though she doesn't uh, capitalize the F in that. So maybe she's Lafond, who knows. Uh, over at Talking Points Memo, she writes that Representative Stephen Lynch, a Democrat of Massachusetts, has eased up on his threat to oppose Nancy Pelosi for Speaker. Politico reported, should we be going to Politico on this? No, never go to Politico if you can help it. During an interview with a local television station on Sunday, flagged by Politico. Oh, see, even Politico didn't really get it. It was a local television station. Nobody gets any credit in the local television world. So uh, anyway, in his interview with, I don't know, some stupid station or another, <laughs> Lynch said that during the January vote for speaker, that would mean the floor vote, not Wednesday's vote, because Wednesday's not January. It's not even December. Uh he would, quote, obviously support Pelosi over a Republican. Pelosi's allies have suggested that voting against Pelosi for speaker would effectively be supporting a Republican. And that's not entirely true, but OK, that's the tactic that's being used. And uh, I don't know if you want to give her demerits for that or not. But anyway, if it becomes a choice between a Republican and Nancy Pelosi, I'll obviously support Nancy Pelosi. Lynch reportedly said Sunday, but I it's, it's reportedly said. It's interesting. Everything's reportedly said. Like we don't what well, we don't believe it if we didn't see it because there's some I have some uh, some stories about that and how uh, I, I think there should be broader skepticism about some other things that we didn't see for ourselves. But okay, we'll leave that aside for now. Uh, but I do think we risk losing the majority in the House. We risk having Trump elected for another four years if the Democrats don't offer a new direction in the Democratic Party. I think he's overstating the case. But OK, Lynch was one of 16 lawmakers and incoming members who signed a letter of intent to oppose Pelosi. The comment adds to reports that Pelosi has quietly quelled a rising faction within her party that was previously intent on dismissing the lame duck minority leader for new leadership. That's an interesting way of, boy, really you have to go out of your way to, to come up with that label, the lame duck minority leader. She's a lame duck as minority leader because they're now in the majority, having come into it under her leadership, of course, but uh, all right, whatever. Uh, let's see. That is linked to another TPM story, uh, one which I have a feeling is tucked away in pocket, but if it isn't, it should be just to sort of fill in a little more detail on uh, this um, what or th this episode. How Pelosi kept her head down, I'm pretty sure this is in pocket, and used her political savvy to quell a rebellion, which is essentially the story now written up in uh, here in Talking Points Memo. Uh, I was actually done at the end of last week, the 23rd. Was that uh, Friday, 26th? Yeah, Friday. But we were, of course, off the air, uh, uh, scaring the cra or actually depressing the crap out of Rebecca, I guess, and probably a few others of you out there. But uh, this story did catch my eye even in the uh, weekend atmosphere. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi Kate Riga 
reports for TPM, has quietly taken the legs out from under the brewing insurrection in the House, looking more than likely now than uh, looking more likely now than ever ahem, to get the gavel. And I don't mean over the head. According to a Thursday Washington Post report, that would have been Thanksgiving, so you were probably busy at the time, Pelosi dealt with the rebellion in her usual way, dismissing breathless reports of her inevitable demise and approaching the disgruntled members one by one to hear them out and strike a compromise. And I told you that's kind of what she does. That's her M.O., and I'm not really sure why people weren't aware of that, but it was in a lot of people's interest to either pretend that this was the first time it was done or that this was qualitatively different in some way than the previous instances in which she's done it, and there's some argument for that. But uh, anyway, this particular report continues with a quote from Ro Khanna of California, She doesn't raise her voice. She doesn't threaten anybody. That's not her style. Uh, Representative Ro Khanna of California told the Washington Post she wins by winning the moral argument, by winning the public relations argument, by winning the argument with groups and activists. She's going to be speaker. In rapid succession, Pelosi has deftly maneuvered challengers and opponents onto her side. First, and we didn't get a chance to discuss this at the end of last week because of the short week, Pelosi got Representative Marsha Fudge, Democrat of Ohio, a possible challenger, to drop the idea of challenging her. That is, by slotting her in the chairmanship of a subcommittee on voting rights. Then she convinced Representative Brian Higgins of New York, a member who signed the letter calling for a new speaker, to retract his statement and throw his throw her his support after listening to his desire to see Medicare expanded. All it takes is a little listening, I guess. Pelosi's not quite out of the woods yet, as of Friday anyway, but the tide has clearly turned with most of the Congressional Black Caucus rallying to her side, along with former President Barack Obama and progressive influencer, (laughs) that's a new title for her, representative, not yet, representative-elect, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of New York. interesting uh, way of wrapping up there. But yeah, essentially, uh, what do you do in the face of an insurrection like this? And I guess it, it makes you wonder how um, how serious was the insurrection? I mean, how serious were they about deposing her versus gaining something? Because if you've been around a little while... And most of the people who, well, a lot of the people who were uh, working in opposition, and there weren't a lot of them, but of the few that there were, a lot of them have been around a little while. Many of them were new members, to be sure. Um, But uh, there was a core, I mean, it doesn't happen without a core of uh, members who've got a couple of terms under their belt. If you've been around a while... You do know how Nancy Pelosi is likely to respond to a threat like this, and it is to uh, work on repairing her coalition, because she knows that that's how this stuff works. So she went to see the people who were objecting to her re-election as speaker, ask not even so much why they were opposing it, but uh, what sorts of things bother you about the direction we've been taking as Democrats and uh, are they issues I can address? Are there things I can do for you that'll make you feel better in general, if not necessarily specifically about my leadership, then better enough, uh, uh, make enough of a difference for you politically that uh, you're able to uh, go back to your district and say you've changed your mind, but still save face. For Marsha Fudge, I guess, who never really necessarily said she was actually into the in the race and or that she absolutely opposed Pelosi, what it took was the chairmanship of a, of a subcommittee, which I guess people thought she was going to hold out for more, but that's actually probably about right. And, uh, you know, it's an issue of tremendous importance to her and from which she thinks she can do a great deal of good for her constituents and probably for the Democratic Party as a whole. And I don't disagree. 
And uh, I think uh, I think it was a fair exchange in that one. I don't know what people got in other instances in exchange for their agreement to back off of the letter. But um, I don't know. Anybody who watched her work w- in the past would be able to tell you that that was a likely tactic for her to take to defuse the rebellion. And if you were really smart, in a way... You know, I know we've been just been spent uh, spent a week talking about how dumb these guys were because they were opposing her in a situation in which, uh, like always, the media was hungry for Democrats in disarray stories, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other possibility is that they were smart. They knew what they could get uh, with a little bit of drama and the threat of hostage taking. And maybe they could wrest something away from her, something she may possibly have been very willing to give away at the time anyway, but uh, she may have been willing to give it to any one of, say, three possible contenders for such a position. And, uh, well, if you can leverage it away from the other two by playing, you know, by pantomiming uh, opposition to her on the floor then uh, maybe that wasn't such a a terrible play after all. Uh, I know that there will be a lot of people who disagree with that and who say, oh my God, no, these people were idiots from the beginning. Like they never had any end game. And there there really wasn't much in the way of a possible end game. And so I know Armando was, uh, you know, among many who were extraordinarily critical of these members. I didn't support what they were doing. It didn't, that's just not the way I like to do things. Although I suppose if you wanted to be a survivor in the cutthroat world of, uh, of, of national politics, you're going to have to, at some point, uh, ponder dabbling in some tactics. But over the weekend, I mean, in, in the rush to condemn the, what, what should we say? And, and, and at least in the in the rush to head off what might have been inevitable Democrats in disarray stories, people were very harshly critical, and you know, rightly so. This is, I mean, nobody thought in doing it. I, I guess if you if you really think that the members who were playing this game were so savvy in all this, they surely would have anticipated the criticism too. So you don't have to feel bad about that in any way. Not that I imagine uh, it bothered Armando any, and it and shouldn't have. But um, there was some real question about, given the dynamics of, of how a speaker is elected, uh, some real questions about where these guys thought this whole thing was going, where they thought the game would end. Because, of course, uh, it's not the case that uh, you know you can win the speakership ordinarily with a mere plurality and so withholding votes for Pelosi even if every single Republican votes for uh, Kevin McCarthy who we assume to be their nominee for speaker uh, there are just aren't enough votes with Republicans only to make McCarthy speaker the only way he would end up getting more votes would be if the requisite number of Democrats voted for someone other than Pelosi, but that would still leave McCarthy with a mere plurality lead, not enough to take the speaker's gavel. They would have to go to a second ballot, at which point the, you know, you'd get your Democrats in disarray stories. Yes, but the Democrats who were holding out would eventually have to decide, what are we going to do here in the end? I mean, we're just going to keep this whole thing in uh, you know, in suspended am- animation, not going to be able to organize the next Congress and just ballot over and over and over again. And nobody budges and nobody elects a speaker. Or are we here to extract something of value in exchange for our ultimate agreement to do that thing that we pledged we weren't going to do? That was the inherent contradiction in all of this. People said, I'm simply not going to vote for Pelosi. And there was just I mean, I guess one of the other possibilities would be if you had 99 ballots, some percentage of the rest of the Democratic caucus would say, I'm tired of this. And although I absolutely do not support the idea of replacing Nancy Pelosi as speaker, 
we've got to have a speaker. But really, you'd be talking about would 16, 17, 18 Democrats really be capable of changing the minds of 200 plus other Democrats? And, you know, it's a lot easier to imagine some number of the 15, 16, 17 Democrats giving up under pressure and just saying, fine, uh, Pelosi, than it is to picture 200 other members saying, okay, some other name out of the hat. So it's not like they were ever, I I, I have a hard time believing that they ever thought they were going to come away with a different Democratic speaker but like we said, if there's uh, if you just imagine that all they're there to do is extract something of value in exchange for their public submission to voting for Pelosi along with the rest of the Democrats, that makes the game that much more understandable. It's more frustrating, annoying, disgusting, what have you, but uh, understandable nonetheless. OK, so let's see. Um Oh, let's see. We've got a couple of uh, uh, comments here. Oh, by the way, it seems Mighty OCD had the had the bead on Stephen Lynch even before I found it. I didn't get a chance to see it. I remembered the tweet that I had seen it in, so I went looking for that. I should have just come straight back to the KITM hashtag column, and I would have found the answer right here. Stephen Lynch, you are correct. And uh, let's see, what's this story? Uh, oh, uh, Greg points us to an old story. Uh, I guess Stephen Lynch has been at it for a while. Uh, and I, I guess uh, we were reading earlier his complaint that, uh, yeah, uh, Nancy Pelosi, she's no good. We're going to lose if we don't get some new leadership, et cetera, et cetera. But what was that? We should actually take a look at, at the language. It wasn't a very long article. Where was it in Lynch? Uh, if it becomes... Uh, oh, yeah, it becomes a choice between a Republican and Nancy Pelosi. I'll obviously support Nancy Pelosi. But I do think we risk losing the majority in the House. We risk having Trump elected for another four years if the Democrats don't offer a new direction in the Democratic Party. So if that's the sort of thing that worries you or scares you, I mean, electing Trump for another four years ought to scare anybody, right? So it's a scare tactic. Uh, Stephen Lynch says, in his estimation, uh, keeping Pelosi at the helm of the House Democratic Caucus and, and, and as Speaker risks losing the majority in the House, risks electing Trump for another four years. In context, then, how do you take that in context? Greg has helped us out with this one, a Politico article dated April 8th, 2015. If you want to know a little bit about Stephen Lynch's track record. This is, uh, again, from Politico. Lauren French writing this piece way back when. Representative Lynch quoted as saying, Pelosi, quote, will not lead us back to the majority. We have our answer now, of course. Uh, In 2015, he was speaking, I think, of the 2016 election, and he was right. She didn't lead us back to the majority, except he didn't wait long enough, I guess. And then she did lead us back to the majority. And I guess the real question is, were there any uh, additional quotes from Stephen Lynch uh, post-2016 and prior to 2018 in which he repeats the same charge? My bet is that there is. It sounds like a stock line of his. Shouldn't have difficulty uncovering such a quote. But here, the one from 2015, Massachusetts Democratic Representative Stephen Lynch said Tuesday that Nancy Pelosi should consider stepping aside from her post as minority leader in the House, speaking on a local television program in Boston. Once again, he loves the local programs. Lynch was pressed on whether Pelosi should continue leading House Democrats after the party lost a substantial number of congressional seats in 2014. Nancy Pelosi will not lead us back into the majority, not, or just to the majority, Lynch said, and he wasn't necessarily limiting his comments to the 2016 election. She will not lead us back to the majority. She did. Ask if Pelosi should resign from her leadership post, Lynch replied, right. Lynch, a moderate, hmm, has never been a Pelosi ally. He criticized the California Democrats' tactics to pass Obamacare in 2010, 
that's not wise. And Pelosi endorsed neither Lynch nor then Representative Ed Markey when the two squared off in the primary for the Massachusetts special election for the Senate that Markey eventually won. Representative Michael Capuano also appeared on WGBH and said Democrats need to shake things up in leadership. Capuano did not directly call on Pelosi to resign, but said change is needed if something you're doing is not working. I think we need leadership that understands that if something you're doing is not working, change what you're doing, Capuano said. Well, now it's working, I guess. And uh, you know, are there other things that could work better? Maybe. I don't know what they are. You don't know what they are. They have some idea, I think, uh, what they wish it was. Capuano, uh, Capuano Democrat. Why is that written that way? Capuano Democrat walked his comment, walked back his comments Wednesday, that was in 2015, saying that Pelosi is making the changes necessary to lead the House Democrats back to electoral success, and I still believe she will do so. Ah, well, Capuano's smarter than Lynch on that front. After House Democrats lost nearly a dozen seats in November, again, that's way back when, in 2014, Pelosi established a series of task forces focused on messaging, voter turnout, and minorities in an effort to improve Democrats' chances in future elections. And uh, how prescient that in 2015, well, I, mean, I actually, honestly, we should have been focusing on it for like 100 years. But yes, focusing on voter turnout and minorities, uh, I guess, uh, well, it tends to do the trick, and it seems to have done the trick here in this case. Drew Hamill, spokesman for Pelosi, noted that both Lynch and Capuano voted for Pelosi when she was elected minority leader last year. So there is that. Pelosi has led the Democratic caucus for years, and while lawmakers criticized the party's message after Democrats lost seats, no one stepped up to challenge the, the California Democrat after the election debacle. Democrats widely agree there's no one ready to pick up her fundraising or legislative portfolio. That, of course, one of the actual knocks on the Democratic leadership, and I think uh, a relatively decent one, though I don't know that they, staging a coup was the way to do it, but then they didn't do that either. Welcome back now to the Get Going the Morning Show here on Roots Radio. Just that one minute break here. Pete, Pete B2 on Twitter, and I don't know other people call him Pete B2 in real life either, but uh, hey, maybe it's possible. Uh, saying, David, you're giving me some heartburn that Pelosi paid the ransom to the hostage takers and that progressive members were suckers for not holding out support. Um, don't worry. How's that? Did, it, did, that, did that help you? There, there's like evidence-based reasons not to worry, uh, but don't. So I just, you know, I don't want your heartburn to run away with you here. They could have put, he in his second comment, he says, they could have put the supermajority tax rule and pay go up as their conditions. Uh, do we have a supermajority tax rule? Which one are we dealing with here? Um, anyway, I don't have too much heartburn. Um, one of the underappreciated by me, I mean, uh, aspects of the early stages of the uh, holdout against Pelosi, going back to the days when it was considered a more serious threat because there were members both to Pelosi's right and to her left threatening possibly to hold out <clears throat> in voting for her and uh, uh at, at that time and, and and she used the same approach more or less the same approach with both of those two factions uh stayed away from from taking swipes at them for the most part uh where she thought there were members who could be persuaded to change their minds, uh, where they were clearly uh, going to be stuck in their opposition. You know, she felt uh, more at liberty to, to take swipes. But uh, she approached the left wing, if you will, of, of the group first, figuring correctly that uh, they might be easier to persuade to come to come home on this vote. And, uh, but, but, uh, they were smart enough to hold out 
for some demands of their own too. Now, do I still have this in pocket is the question. And uh, if I do, or did I, did I read it already? I, but uh, I, I think I read something about it, but uh, the process by which most of those in on, on the left, that is to say the progressive caucus folks came back and potential new members of the progressive caucus came back to Pelosi on this did in fact involve uh, some demands and they got them. And uh, I know I uh, read an article probably in the beginning of last week, uh, I guess into possibly some of the podcast shows that hinted at it, but I don't know if I grabbed any of the more recent pieces. And I, I okay, so the, not having the pieces in front of me limits me only in giving the proper credit to the people who executed the strategy. But the gist of it was uh, that uh, progressive caucus members made their own demands. Actually, uh, and this was a rather, you know, uh, forward uh, demand, you know, rather more aggressive than I'm used to seeing from the progressive caucus. But, uh, and, and I'm not sure how it was structured, and I'm not sure as a result how well we're going to do in living up to the agreement, but progressive caucus members were able to extract at least the outlines of a plan to make sure, and again, I'm not positive how you're really going to execute this, but the, the, the goal was to make sure that Progressive caucus members, and really, I mean, that's a terrible label, if only because anyone can join pretty much the progressive caucus. If you think that being a member of the progressive caucus is something that helps sell you in your district, you join the progressive caucus, whether you're really a progressive or not. And I don't even want to get into the debate of who's really a progressive, but you don't have to be particularly progressive to agree to label yourself as a member of the progressive caucus. And the progressive caucus has had great difficulty in uh in in achieving coherence on on policy matters voting as a block uh has not been a really super successful endeavor for progressive caucus membership in a long time and that's why uh for many years the progressive caucus uh, had a membership list twice the size of the Blue Dog Caucus, for instance, or the New Democrats Caucus. But it was always the Blue Dogs and or the New Democrats who were able to leverage things out of the leadership uh, in in uh, the legislative process because although they were half the size, they were of sufficient size to hold things up legislatively. And they were much more coherent and could promise their votes as a block much more easily and therefore rest away, you know, concessions by holding important bills when, when Democrats were in the majority anyway, by, by uh, holding bills hostage. Progressives uh, were less inclined to do that for a number of reasons. And one of them is that as progressives, they were loath to hold people, you know, hold people's feet to the fire, their own people's feet to the fire and uh, punish them for not towing the party line. Because we always feel like that's that's the sort of thing that, oh, I don't know, fascists do or at least Republicans do. <clears throat> Whereas, you know, we hope that the moral argument will persuade you. And we are, I guess, always hopeful that, well, you would only join the Progressive Caucus if you were progressive so that you were subject to the moral argument. But then we found out that there were a lot of people who were joining because it you know, pays in their district to be able to say they're a member of the Progressive Caucus, even if they're not particularly progressive. We even found out that, I mean, look, there's people that, do, that join every caucus. Uh, and we saw that on the Republican side, too. Uh, people joined the Tea Party Caucus, actually the most enthusiastic joiners of the Tea Party Caucus in on the Republican side, you may recall from our discussion of this years ago. Uh, well, I don't even know. I mean, we must have discussed it on the radio, but even back in the 
prior back in the before days of radio when I had to write everything down and post it on Daily Coast, we talked about the fact that a, a significant percentage, the, by far the majority of the membership of the House Republicans Tea Party Caucus were people who had been in office in, in Congress well before the emergence of the Tea Party. In other words, it wasn't the Tea Party that had brought them there. They weren't uh, raised in the Tea Party culture and then elected to Congress. They were elected well before the Tea Party's formulation and then simply jumped on the bandwagon. Like Michelle Bachman, who named herself as chairperson of the House Tea Party Caucus, was in Congress well before there was a Tea Party. And and most of the Tea Party elected members avoided, at first anyway, the Tea Party Caucus. And they, they opted uh, in greater numbers to join the Freedom Caucus and other similarly stupidly named uh, caucuses, but they stayed away from the Tea Party Caucus. And so we have a similar problem in the Progressive Caucus. We want numbers, so you're welcome to join, and maybe you'll be persuaded by our moral arguments while you're here, but we, there's no uh, ideological test to join. And uh, most progressives would say, yeah, I wouldn't be into that anyway. So at any rate, they managed to uh, extract from the leadership. Uh, over the years, they got much better at holding their block of votes together. Uh, and uh, maybe that had something to do with it. They managed to extract from leadership a promise of sorts, a commitment to making sure that a significant portion of some of the key committees, sometimes the money committees, they sometimes call them, uh, which uh, not only indicates their importance, but also those are committees from which you can do a significant amount of fundraising because they control sectors of the economy that, uh, well, essentially you're able to extort lots of money from corporate interests, which is usually not a good thing, but, uh, you know, money playing the role it does, I guess even progressives recognize this, but uh, they were able to extract from the leadership a commitment to making sure that progressive caucus members were significantly uh, well represented on key committees. Uh, I, I don't, again, I don't know how they enforce this thing, but the idea was that you would be taking progressives and putting them in places where not only could you rake in a lot of money or control the policy surrounding a lot of money, if you don't feel like you know, you're going to use that position to raise corporate funds, a lot of people have forsworn corporate funds, but at least you'll be, you'll be on hand to temper legislation that, yes, Democrats have often been tempted to shape in ways that are distinctly pro corporate uh you know and rightly upsetting the more progressive wing of the democratic party it's the sort of democrats we're frequently finding ourselves disappointed in and sometimes you know people that we like do sometimes find themselves casting votes in support of that legislation and it's a disappointment and so i guess the thinking is even if you're not going to use the position to raise lots of corporate cash though you could uh it gives you the opportunity to, uh, let's say, babysit the rest of the Democratic caucus there and to make sure that it's not going to be a cakewalk every time to report out uh, wildly pro-corporate legislation from a Democratic Party-controlled committee, as as all of them will be in the House. and uh, And then cornering the rest of the progressive caucus into voting in favor of it, lest control of the floor be wrested away from us by Republicans. Uh, so that's been a major fault in the system for a long time. And I, I kudos to those who recognized it inside the Progressive Caucus and said, we need to make sure that there are that our own interests are represented on these committees so that we don't keep getting stuck between a rock and a hard place with legislation that really has no place on the democratic agenda in the first place. So take heart in that, I guess, uh, or take that as a remedy for your, for your heartburn. 
I guess. How about that? Um, let's see. So I guess now Pete has sent, has sent me the Daily Beast article. It's going to tell me about the supermajority tax rule that you're talking about. I, uh, and, uh, well, I, I hope that actually, as I'm looking over the headline here, it may be that a lot of the uh, problems here are addressed by, or at least it was the hope that they would be addressed by, the concessions sought by the Progressive Caucus. Dear Nancy Pelosi, the headline is in the Daily Beast and House Democrats, why are you embracing trickle-down economics? What sorts of things are we talking about? Well, in this case, it's very specific. Last week, House Democratic leaders embraced requiring a supermajority to raise middle-class taxes, affirming 40 years of anti-government can't. And that's shameful. Nick Hanauer reports, I guess you're right, and I guess it's uh, very nearly, I guess, too late to deal with that one. But I, I don't know whether that was considered a high priority or maybe it was one or the other. And I think maybe the Progressive Caucus made the right choice in this. But I guess you're talking about an internal House Democratic Caucus rule. Rather than, are we talking about, I would, I would think it would be awfully dangerous to put that in the House standing rules, a supermajority to raise middle class taxes. All right, so let's take a look at this piece, though. Economic prosperity doesn't trickle down, but apparently stupid political ideas do. Yeah. Last week, Mike DeBonis at uh, the Washington Post, I hope we have his name pronounced correctly, uh, reported on a list of rule changes approved by incoming Democratic congressional leadership. Some of the proposed rules are common sense reforms. I'm all for allowing a three-day review period before bringing legislation to the floor, for example. And I support... Uh, that'll get waived soon enough. And I support requiring committees to solicit legislative ideas from colleagues who don't sit on those committees. But one of the proposed rules is so ideologically bankrupt that if you told me it flowed directly from the desk of Paul Ryan, I'd believe you. DeBonis wrote that Democrats are proposing a rule to, quote, create a supermajority requirement to raise individual income taxes on the lowest earning four-fifths of taxpayers. In other words, Congress would have to muster a near impossible three-fifths majority to raise taxes, any taxes, on the lowest earning 80 percent of taxpayers. And I mean, we want to protect the lower earning taxpayers. True. Mm, but I see the point here, worrying, I'm sure, about flexibility in the future. And, you know, things get waived, but uh, it's embarrassing to have to do it. Anyway, under current Republican rules, the House already requires a supermajority to raise any taxes, period. So technically, Democrats are just making it easier to raise taxes on the rich. But this is the kind of self-defeating neoliberal hair splitting that makes me hate my own party. First, it's just bad politics. In proposing this rule, Democrats are actually affirming the last 40 years of anti-government messaging from trickle-downers like Grover Norquist, Mitch McConnell, and the Koch brothers, a message that insists the tax that taxes are always bad. Worse, by publicly handcuffing themselves to the Republican minority in a feckless display of fiscal restraint, Democrats actually reinforce the car caricature, if you like that pronunciation, of themselves as profligate tax and spenders. Stop me before I tax again! is the message the supermajority rule sends to voters. I can understand that. Second, the supermajority rule is just awful policy, especially when combined with a proposal to bring back pay-go rules, which Nancy Pelosi said months ago Democrats would adhere to if they gained the majority. The bonkers trickle-down trickle down policy that requires Congress to either cut the budget or hike taxes to offset any new spending. Republicans always vote against tax increases, always under any circumstances and for any purpose. So guess which option they'll always choose. Why would a newly elected Democratic majority give Republicans veto power over any new Democratic agenda? It's like shooting yourself in the foot seconds before starting a marathon. Third, because supermajority rules in general are profoundly undemocratic, this rule sets a dangerous precedent, particularly in an era when Republicans seem eager to undermine all our Democratic institutions. Through their gerrymandering, voter suppression, and routine trashing of democratic norms, Republicans have already made impressive progress toward establishing a government of minority rule. So, if Democrats endorse giving the Republican, mar Republican minority a veto over tax policy, 
To what policies will Republicans seek to apply supermajority requirements next? Not a bad argument. No doubt some in leadership thought this tinkering with the rule a savvy political move, creating an opportunity to repeal the bulk of the Trump-Ryan tax cuts without exposing Democrats to the usual Republican anti-tax fear-mongering. But breaking news, fellow Dems, Republicans and their Fox News surrogates are going to cast you as godless socialists regardless of what you do, so you might as well just quit the tinkering and repeal that BS Republican-era rule. Look, only diehard Republican toadies and corporate stooges are dumb enough to believe that taxes are always bad. The vast majority of Democrats, independents, and realistic conservatives understand that taxes are how a society comes together to solve shared problems. Taxes pay for our roads and our information infrastructure. They pay for the first responders who are right now fighting wildfires in California. I guess to somewhat less extent today, but okay. Taxes, only because they've been effective. Taxes keep us safe and enrich our lives in countless ways every day. The middle class of America votes by initiative to raise their own taxes all the time, to improve our schools and modernize our libraries, to keep our children safe and plan for the future. We love to pay taxes <laughs> when they are used to promote the general welfare. Now, what middle American tax, uh, middle class, rather, American middle class loathes are dumb taxes, taxes that exclude the wealthy and powerful at the expense of everyone else. They hate regressive taxes that penalize the poorest Americans while leaving me and my wealthy pals entirely untouched. I guess we're talking to a wealthy guy here. Uh, is there much more? Yeah, I got uh, not that much here. The Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy has found that from 2000 to 2018, the richest 20% of Americans have enjoyed 65% of all the tax cuts. We know about that. With the remaining 35% of tax cuts divided between the other 80%. The lesson from this finding is not that we should make it harder to raise taxes on the lowest earning 80th percentile of taxpayers. The lesson is we need to establish a sane tax code the taxes corporations and wealthy folks like me, not me, but him, before we consider raising taxes on anyone else. Presenting real, diligent, uh, intelligent, rather, sweeping change that brings our tax code in line with our values as a 21st century economy, not fiddling with the failed neoliberal policies that have driven American income inequality to record highs, should be the day one agenda for House Democrats. If voters wanted a bunch of trickle-downers, They'd have voted Republican. So stop looking over your shoulders, Democrats. Start marching forward and deliver the bold, progressive economic narrative and agenda the American middle class desperately wants and needs. Well, it certainly would be easier to do. And the concessions that were won by the uh, progressive holdouts, such as they were, um, might make a difference in this, though they might have made a greater difference had this been prevented uh and i guess uh well now's the time to complain about it because it ain't a done deal yet and they've got some time to tinker with the rules package before they present it for a final vote on the floor on january 3rd and it will be adopted on a party line vote so whatever dems say goes as far as the house rules go so uh good point pete and it may be a good time <clears throat> pardon me, to prevail on your Democratic representatives to change the way they approach that in the rules package uh, between now and January. So thanks very much for bringing that to our attention. Well worth our time. Okay, other things that are happening in the world. Uh, well, uh, turns out last week we updated you just in time on the Interpol thing. I guess we actually covered that on Monday, Tuesday, before we went into pre-taped shows and then finally into reruns. But uh, I guess by the time the Thanksgiving show had aired, we uh, had received news that, uh, hey, con our, uh, trouble avoided. The Russian official who had been put forward as the uh, possible next president of Interpol was in a surprise move, I guess, defeated in his election. And instead, uh, the candidate put forward by the South Koreans 
took over the reins of Interpol. AP reports here from the end of last week, Interpol's flaws exposed in U.S.-Russia fight over presidency. Aya Batrawi and Angela Charlton wrote this piece on November 21st for AP. Uh, I guess the voting was done in Dubai, UAE. How interesting in its own right. Um, In uh, Dateline Dubai here, the U.S. won, Russia lost, and Interpol narrowly escaped disaster. That's the upshot of an unusually high drama vote for the International Police Agency's president, dominated by fears that Russia wants to turn Interpol into a tool to hunt down its enemies. While rights groups and Kremlin critics celebrated the surprise victory of South Korean candidate Kim jong Yang after over his Russian rival, the vote exposed flaws within Interpol that won't vanish overnight. Now the pressure is on Kim and Interpol's day-to-day boss, Secretary General Jurgen Stock, to fix them. The White House came out publicly against the candidacy of Kim's Russian rival. How interesting. Alexander Prokopchuk. After the election, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo called Kim the right man to lead one of the world's most critical law enforcement bodies in its mission to preserve the rule of law and make the world a safer place, unquote. For Interpol, the vote staved off possible collapse after rumblings of some member from some member countries about quitting the agency. The vote shows that members thought really hard about whether they want to back away from this institution or make sure it's run properly and operated, we'll say, fairly, said Yago Russell, chief of Fair Trials International, which has championed and monitored Interpol's reform efforts. Authoritarian governments have long sought to leverage Interpol's reach, and notably its system of red notices that flag suspects for arrest wherever they go, for political ends. While it has tried to clean up this system, it remains vulnerable to pressure from powerful member states. Its last president vanished in China in a possible political purge, while Interpol quietly looked on. Stock, or perhaps Stoke, I don't know how he would pronounce it, but Jürgen makes me think it might be Stoke, S-T-O-C-K. The Secretary General acknowledged that systems can be improved, but stressed that Interpol's information sharing systems have led to the arrest of 10,000 serious criminals so far this year. It is fundamental to Interpol's existence that we are neutral and that we are independent, he insisted. All right. Um, uh, Well, we might as well read on and see whether there's any more insightful uh, looks inside the workings of Interpol. There was... Uh, let's see, a central argument for the U.S. and governments in Europe and elsewhere who lobbied against Russian Security Service veteran Prokopchuk. Western powers warned that a Russian victory would have led to further abuses of Interpol by the Kremlin, seeking to go after political opponents and fugitive dissidents. Uh, well, let's see. Um, so uh, the balance of the article is uh, hoping that there will be, is about hoping that there will be continued reforms of other issues that cause problems between member states. Um, But I did happen to see also, uh, we'll see if we can grab something on it, uh, but uh, I'll have to make a note for myself to see if we can pick it up. But tweets from uh, Bill Browder and Michael McFowl, Browder and McFowl, uh, Browder, of course, the uh, hedge fund executive, who uh, has found himself on the wrong side of Putin by pillaging Russian state assets as a hedge fund investor and not kicking up properly to Putin, essentially, I think is what happened here. I don't know if anybody would be as bold as to simply come right out and say it, but um, the oligarch class there, mobster class, they all exploited uh, Russian state assets and stole from them in order to become billionaires. Browder, I suspect, did much the same thing, but had the gall, one, to be originally American, and two, uh, I guess at some point he decided he wanted to keep most of that money and not kick it up to Putin, or at least not cooperate with him in the ways that uh, keep him happy. And so he was on the outs, and when you're on the outs with Putin, you are either... Uh, declared a criminal or murdered or some combination of the two. And that's how we got to the Magnitsky problem. Michael McFowl, the former ambassador to 
uh, Russia under the Obama administration. And uh, he, too, obviously a prominent critic of the Putin regime because there's so much to criticize. And I guess the two of them have been chased around with the threats of Interpol red notices for both of them. And I, I, they both were noticing Browder calling it out more prominently, I guess, and McFowl finally joining in, that uh, they had been harassed on Twitter over the last couple of days by Russian bots over the Interpol issue. And I guess that's finally disappearing for them now that Prokopchuk lost. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGO in the Morning, interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of KGO in the Morning. Thousands of you are downloading the show each day, but fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air. For the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com makes it easy. You can find us there by searching Kegro X or David Waldman or Kegro in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring, monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. All right, welcome back now to the Kegel in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's see. Uh, I did find uh, <clears throat> the Twitter stream of Bill Browder, and uh, you can take a, a look at it, but uh, let's see. Um, the one that caught my eye today was just him tweeting about very interesting analysis of one of the many random Russians trolling me and McFowl. Uh, it's all very transparent when you look carefully. He's pointing at the Twitter account of Conspirator Zero, who uh, writes that uh, during the recent period where it seemed plausible that Alexander Prokopchuk would be elected head of Interpol, an account named, and I think rather obviously named, Robotnik69. Now, why would you go with such an obvious name? Uh, there's some information about that. But Robotnik69 surfaced to gleefully speculate about the possibility of McFowl and Bill Browder being taken into Russian custody. And there's a screenshot of some of the exchanges here. Michael McFowl having tweeted on November 17th, I cannot believe that a Russian official will lead Interpol. Uh, Russia has an unimpressive record, that's a mild way of saying it, of practicing the rule of law at home and a proven track record of abusing red notices and diffusions for political purposes. I don't know what diffusions are, but I imagine they're similar or somehow related. Uh, so now Robotnik 69, who also identifies, uh, as with the label of Rene Erlanger here, Robotnik 69 is the, <clears throat> the actual Twitter address, the name that they attached to it, I guess they thought sounded more Western Rene Erlanger. Uh, and I guess they thought they would cover things up that way. Anyway, responds to McFowl by saying about time Russians used Interpol to bring your sorry ass back to Russia for some serious questioning, which, as you recall, was one of the demands that Putin made of Trump at one of their stupid secret meetings alongside one of the uh, economic conferences, and everyone was aghast that Trump didn't uh, say, no, that's disgusting, how dare you ask me, but instead contemplated it, at least for a while, even though he didn't take any action on it. Uh, somebody else chiming in here saying, uh, Russia isn't bringing an American citizen anywhere. Robotnik coming back with, let's see when McFowl steps outside the USA. So, you know, some fairly ridiculous threats here. And then, of course, because it's a bot, it dips into the anti-Semitic as well. Next tweeting, Bill Browder, the Chicago Jew, is a corrupt con man. He even took off from the USA for a while. He pillaged Russian state assets. I do agree he probably did do that. Buying them on the cheap, which is, of course, how Putin got ultra wealthy and all of his friends got ultra wealthy as well. Not mentioned here. And did not pay any taxes on his ill-gotten gains during the Yeltsin years. He belongs behind bars. Uh, maybe. I mean, maybe you should be paying taxes on that in Russia. I don't really know. Uh, maybe it was a favor that Yeltsin did for his people. I don't know. Maybe it was part of the reason why uh, Putin rose to power, pointing out the corruption 
uh, in the uh, Yeltsin administration, although uh, ultimately it seems clear now anyway that his ultimate goal was to simply pocket that benefit for himself and his friends. And he's done it more successfully than Yeltsin did because he's ex-KGB and he'll murder you if you don't knuckle under to it. That was Yeltsin's failing, I guess, in becoming the autocratic leader of all the Russias. Anyway, uh, Robotnik then continues, well, Bill Browder is a criminal. There's no doubt about that. There is, but not there anyway. With his company, Hermitage Capital, pillaging millions of dollars worth of Russian state assets on the cheap and fleeing Russia with unpaid Russian taxes. McFowl, I'm guessing it's for political interference. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, that's a projection for you. And then another tweet at Putin and Trump conference in Helsinki. McFowl and Bill Browder were mentioned in their speeches. In their exchange, Putin mentioned that if Mueller wanted to question 12 Russians, then the Russians wanted Bill Browder and McFowl for past transgressions. Now go and boil an egg, which sounds very, very American. Anyway, it turns out in Conspirator Zero's further inquiries, uh, Robotnik69 is apparently an account created in 2015, which would have been before widespread knowledge among average American users of Twitter that there were hundreds, thousands of Russian-owned, Russian-controlled bots out there. So the Robotnik 69 thing would likely just have struck us all as a funny, tongue-in-cheek sort of handle to grab, not an obvious admission that it was a Russian bot. Apparently created in 2015. Uh, not much in the way of early tweets, though the early tweeting was apparently given over to... Attacking Elliot Higgins, uh, founder of Belling Cat, you know, perhaps uh, of, about uh, that site. But Elliot Higgins over his research on chemical attacks in Syria, followed by a nearly three year gap in which there was no activity whatsoever. And then come back guns blazing for Bill Browder and Mike McFowl. I don't know what the, exactly that tells you, but it strongly hints, of course, that uh, it, 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 it is everything that it purports to be in the name Robotnik 69. It was just uh, poorly chosen, uh, but just happened to be laying around dormant and available for this new campaign, including the anti-Semitic campaign against Bill Browder. All right. Very interesting. I uh, just wanted you to keep an eye on that one. Many more things to get to. Uh, many more things I'm sure that we will not, but uh, it's out there. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, observation, I thought, uh, that encapsulated things well from Brian Klass, a political scientist at UCL. What is UCL? I don't know. doesn't matter. But uh, a prominent figure on Twitter that many of you likely follow. I thought he put things correctly in... Uh, summing up the weekend for the president, there is a worrying international security crisis brewing in Ukraine, and President Trump is watching Fox News to see who praises him and then is tweeting his favorite quotes. That's basically how he spent his day. Rather than actually working the phones internationally to get a handle on the crisis, taking briefings, etc., he wants to know who's saying what about me and is that, a, you know, and if it's good enough, I'll tweet it out as well. I'm just going to watch the telly telly and tell you who's saying nice things about me. Not, there's nothing about the Ukraine in this one, as a matter of fact. And he just he tweets or uh, he includes Donald Trump's tweet uh, about what's going on at the border. Gen General Anthony Tata, is that his, the guy's name? It's T-A-T-A. -T -A. That's got to make, I'm sure, that Trump giggles at that one. President Trump... The quote he pulled from TV, President Trump is a man of his word, and he said he was going to be tough on the border, capitalizing border, and he is tough on the border. He has rightfully strengthened the border in the face of an unprecedented threat. It's the right move by President Trump. Thanks, General. That's actually his monitoring of the situation at the border. Gassing babies. But uh, Donald Trump's concern here is uh, how do I look and uh, who's saying nice things about me? Anyway, I just thought 
that was probably the best encapsulation of how Trump spent his weekend. Uh, more important stories. There are many. And I don't know which to go with first. But uh, here's, here's how I'm going to commit for the rest of the show. Carol Cadwallader, whose name I've still... Uh, I've never bothered to figure out how do you pronounce it. And it's really uh, uh, a shame because we keep going back to her reporting. She's been tweeting all weekend about this very interesting story. And I want to bring it to your attention because it connects uh, the already connected uh, 2016 election here in the United States and the Brexit referendum in the UK. And uh, one other connection uh, that uh, that's procedural in nature that I think is worth uh, noting. All right, now I grabbed two of her tweets, both of which I think link to the same piece in The Guardian, and it's her piece, so uh, she's right in trying to raise awareness of it by tweeting about it twice, but let me grab these two tweets. I think the first one I grabbed was this one here, in which she says, America! She's addressing us here. America, colon, and it's all caps, so it's important. Everything about this story is extraordinary. This almost never happens. UK Parliament sent Sergeant at Arms to US Citizens Hotel to seize internal Facebook docs alleged to contain explosive revelations relating to Cambridge Analytica, like Greg told you, and their data abuse. And that does sound extraordinary. There's another tweet of hers, I think, is later on. I haven't compared the dates here. I wonder if this will go down as a watershed moment. British Parliament takes battle to Facebook by any means necessary. Everything about this is extraordinary and unprecedented. The beginning of the beginning of the end, question mark. Uh, I guess hedging there. Is it the beginning of the end? No, it's the beginning of the beginning of the end. Uh, both, I think, pointing to the same, yes, uh, piece here entitled Parliament Seizes Cash of Facebook Internal Papers. We'll take a look at that. I just wanted to preface it by saying, does everybody, or asking, does everybody recognize what she's talking about here? Uh, and uh, she's right, almost never happens. I don't know how often it happens in the UK. Unprecedented? Not exactly, although I'm sure that it's happened in the UK. It's also sort of kind of happened here in the United States. What I mean is she's talking here about the inherent contempt power. I know you've heard me talk about it in the past. You've heard me write about read me writing about it. You've heard me talk about it here on the show. Um, that's what's happening, except it's the UK Parliament doing it rather than the United States Congress. So I, well, here's what I want you to keep in mind. I'm going to read you the story in The Guardian about what's going on in the UK. You'll see that it is extraordinary. You'll see that she's right and it uh, should be worrying for the players in the Brexit uh, debacle over there, particularly those who may have worked behind the scenes or sometimes in front of the scenes to manipulate the outcome of the vote. But what I want U.S. listeners to keep in mind is the United States Congress has this same power. It just rarely, if ever, exercises it. It hasn't exercised it in nearly 100 years. And this is, of course, a rather extraordinary exercise of it. A subpoena not to force a witness to come before them, but uh, I guess what would be the, the legislative equivalent of a court's subpoena ducis tecum. Is that correct pronunciation of the Latin? In other words a subpoena for seizing some thing, some piece of evidence that will be important to their proceedings, not just forcing a witness to come forward and say they don't recall a uh, hundred times over and over again. So keep in mind, the Congress in the United States can do this. The newly constituted, democratically controlled House of Representatives presumably can do the same thing. There's some question in my mind about how comfortable they feel exercising the inherent contempt power on behalf of the House alone, as opposed to getting the concurrence of the Senate and uh, leveling contempt of Congress charges and using the inherent contempt power to enforce it uh, as against the infraction as 
uh, agreed to as, as outlined by both houses. But technically, the power is there. So keep that in mind as we read Carol Cadwallader's piece in The Observer, or rather in The Guardian, under the uh, header of The Observer, I guess the column. Parliament seizes cache of Facebook internal papers. Subheader reads, documents alleged to contain revelations on data and privacy controls that led to Cambridge Analytica scandal. This a November 24th piece again in The Guardian. Parliament has used its legal powers to seize internal Facebook documents in an extraordinary attempt to hold the U.S. social media giant to account after Chief Executive Mark Zuckerberg repeatedly refused to answer MPs' questions. The cache of documents is alleged to contain significant revelations about Facebook decisions on data and privacy controls that led to the Cambridge Analytica scandal. It is claimed... They include confidential emails between senior executives and correspondence with Zuckerberg. Damian Collins, the chair of the Culture, Media, and Sport Select Committee. It's interesting. It doesn't sound like it would ordinarily be the center of powerful activity or this sort of uh, investigative activity. But I guess they took their mandate and ran with it. Culture, Media, yeah, and Sport. Hmm. Okay, Select Committee. Anyway, they invoked a rare parliamentary mechanism though they don't appear to name it up front here, a rare parliamentary mechanism to compel the founder of a U.S. software company, not Facebook, but 643, and that is uh, written out as S-I-X, the number four, and then T-R-H-E-E, -E, all one word, 643, to hand over the documents during a business trip to London. So just to reconstruct that sentence for you, the chair of the Committee on Culture, Media, and Sport, a select committee in Parliament, invoked a rare parliamentary mechanism to compel the founder of this software company, 643, to hand over documents during a business trip to London. In another exceptional move, Parliament sent a sergeant-at-arms, which they spell S-E-R-J-E-N-T-E-A-N-T. -E -E Interesting enough, I guess we went with the French on that one. Sergeant-at-arms to his hotel with a final warning and a two-hour deadline to comply with its order. When the software firm founder failed to do so, it's understood he was escorted to Parliament. He himself, interestingly. He was told he risked fines and even imprisonment if he didn't hand over the documents. Wow, we are in uncharted territory, said Collins, that's the chair of this committee, who also chairs an inquiry into fake news. This is an unprecedented move, but it's an unprecedented situation. We've failed to get answers from Facebook, and we believe the documents contain information of very high public interest. The seizure is the latest move in a bitter battle between the British Parliament and the social media giant. The struggle to hold Facebook to account has raised concerns about limits of British authority over international companies that now play a key role in the domestic, oh, I'm sorry, in the dem democratic process. Facebook which has lost more than $100 billion in value since March when the Observer, this being, uh, I guess, this column here, exposed how Cambridge Analytica had harvested data from 87 million U.S. users faces another potential PR crisis. It is believed the documents will lay out how user data decisions were made in the years before the Cambridge Analytica breach, including what Zuckerberg and senior executives knew. MPs leading the inquiry into fake news have repeatedly tried to summon Zuckerberg to explain the company's actions. He has repeatedly refused. Collins said this reluctance to testify, plus misleading testimony from an executive at a hearing in February, had forced MPs to explore other options for gathering information about Facebook operations. We have very serious questions for Facebook. It misled us about Russian involvement on the platform, and it has not answered our questions about who knew what with regards, uh, who knew what when, with regards to the Cambridge Analytica scandal, he said. Uh, and by the way, I mean, they keep referring to it as the Cambridge Analytica scandal, and uh, there are some linked articles here, and I think there are two separate ones uh, linked on the Cambridge Analytica name, but let's see, Cambridge Analytica scandal. I mean, there's several here. There's a Cambridge Analytica files 
s- uh, a link out here. There's uh, a piece called Cambridge Analytica kept Facebook data models through U.S. election. There's one. The URL is Facebook Brexit Russia unresolved 40 questions is the last one. Uh, linked to the words Cambridge Analytica scandal, but perhaps you might want to chase those links down and get a fuller picture of what they regard to be the Cambridge Analytica scandal with regard to Britain and Brexit. Anyway, so lots of questions unanswered and uh, they're fed up with it over there in the British Parliament. We have followed this court case in America and we believe these documents contained answers to some of the questions we have been seeking about the use of data, especially by external developers. The documents seized were obtained during a legal discovery process by 643. It took action against the social media giant after investing $250,000 in an app. 643 alleges the cash shows Facebook was not only aware of the implications of its privacy policy, but actively exploited them intentionally creating and effectively flagging up the loophole. What? Effectively flagging up the loophole that Cambridge Analytica used to collect data. That raised the interest of Collins and his committee. A Facebook spokesperson said that 643's claims have no merit and we will continue to defend ourselves vigorously. So if I understand that 643 is suing Facebook and in discovery got a hold of this cache of documents, and the parliament said, will you give us the documents, figuring that they'd be perhaps more willing to give them to him than Facebook was, but apparently he wasn't, so they just grabbed them. I don't know whether that's necessarily the best play. Why not grab... I, well, he's the only one to put himself in their jurisdiction, I guess. A Facebook spokesperson, again, says, uh, 643's claims have no merit. They'll continue to defend themselves. The files are subject to an order of a Californian superior court, that's the way they write it up here, so cannot be shared or made public at risk of being found in contempt of court. Ah, okay. Because the MP's summons was issued in London, where Parliament has jurisdiction, it is understood the company founder, although a U.S. citizen, had no choice but to comply. It is understood that 643 have informed both the court in California and Facebook's lawyers. Interesting. What a twist. Facebook said the materials obtained by the DCMS committee are subject to a protective order in the San Mateo Superior Court restricting their disclosure. We have asked the DCMS committee to refrain from reviewing them and to return them to counsel or to Facebook. We have no further comment. It is unclear what, if any, legal moves Facebook can make to prevent publication. UK, Canada, Ireland, Argentina, Brazil, Singapore, and Latvia will all have representatives joining what looks set to be a high-stakes encounter between Facebook and politicians. What is it? Richard Allen, Vice President for Policy, who will testify at the special session after Zuckerberg declined to attend, said the company takes its responsibility around a number of important issues around privacy, safety, and democracy very seriously. Okay, I don't even really know what we gleaned from the ending of that piece. But uh, what's most important to me is to illustrate to you how the British use their inherent contempt power. I don't know whether they call it inherent contempt power, but it is absolutely the very same mechanism. And uh, it's very interesting. And I I love the uh, procedural twist that uh, brings them around to using this <clears throat> against 643. They must really feel like they're beset from all sides, the poor guys. But okay, I guess uh, the choice was pretty simple. Just uh, file your grievance with court and notify Facebook's lawyers and avoid going to jail in Britain and say there was nothing I could do about it. Those tyrannical British, why you Americans should declare your independence from them. But when you do... Make sure you bestow on your own Congress exactly the same power. That is a little weird, isn't it? Okay. Anyway, I just thought that that uh, was critical to put on the record to uh, b- before it develops any further. I want you to be able to, to follow along with that. And again, inherent contempt could become extraordinarily interesting in the near future. Okay. Uh, 
man, there's an awful lot of things to get to. Um, I, I don't even know that. Uh, well, we can't dive into yet another story here, but we might as well use a few remaining minutes for me to put out a couple other issues on the record. If you've been following along on Twitter over the weekend, you will have seen me object to some of the weirder and more egregious developments over the weekend, actually from the middle of last week, carrying forward into the weekend. And I believe that it was Wednesday of last week uh, when Trump (sighs) claims, I guess, to have issued this very strange, I must have something about it here somewhere, right? Uh, Claims to have issued an order, and I I at least have this thing here uh, from the Daily Beast reporters, uh, Spencer Ackerman and uh, Asawin uh, Subsang, whose name also I always worry about. Um, But uh, I guess we're going to have to chase down the providence of this thing. But essentially, it was the claim of the Trump White House that an order had gone out of dubious provenance, uh, and I think dubious existence even, that purports to authorize the use of lethal force by uh, troops, and I guess also now we should include border agents, against migrants at the southern border with Mexico. And this thing is very troubling, not only for its purported substantive content, but also its provenance itself. In other words, it is not an order given by directly by the supposed commander in chief, the purported president of the United States, Donald Trump, but rather takes the form of what chief of staff uh, John Kelly is calling a cabinet directive, a, a form I'm not familiar with. Um, that is supposed to somehow substitute for and carry the weight of a presidential order. Uh, But, of course, the use of force by uh, American troops inside the United States at the border in support of a police function is widely considered to be illegal and unconstitutional. And... uh, well, I don't know if it's necessarily considered to be unconstitutional, but illegal, certainly, under the Posse Comitatus Act. And uh, so, you know, and uh, therefore an illegal order and uh, not one that any member of the military would be safe in executing. And apparently, Defense Secretary Jim Mattis objects to it strongly enough to say, for his part, that it would be, you know, the, the armed forces wouldn't be implementing the order. I, I, here's what I need to put on the record and what we did over the weekend. I don't actually believe that this thing exists, or at least that it existed at the time it was reported. It's now coming up on five days since the president alleged, or the White House alleged that this order or directive was issued, and I haven't seen it, and I am not aware of its publication anywhere for the public uh, to, to review. And not only that, but of course... I don't know that uh, there's no reason to accept it as valid simply because a thing is printed or purportedly reprinted in the press either. I really, at this point, need to see the physical document. I want to see the signature on it. I know that it's not Donald Trump's, but I'd like to see it and examine it, not only for its content, but, you know, to try and determine its provenance here. This, like so many other things is something that I think that we do ourselves a great disservice in simply assuming that it's valid. Uh, And in many cases, uh, we do a disservice to ourselves assuming that it even exists. I understand from other reporting from last week and carrying over through the weekend that there is some question about where is the paperwork and who has seen the paperwork purporting to name Matt Whitaker as acting attorney general. For some reason, for some strange reason, the White House to date refuses to share this paperwork. And when questioned about the contents of the paperwork, uh, i.e., when did this appointment become effective, they, uh, Wikipedia will tell you 
November 7th, but based on what, we don't know, because the White House apparently refuses to confirm, for those who inquire, the actual start date for Matt Whitaker's stint as the purported acting attorney general. I think that may have something to do with the fact, also recently reported, that Matt Whitaker apparently revised his required federal financial disclosure forms five times in between this purported start date of November 7th and uh, the end of last week, which would be a two-week period. Five revisions in the past two weeks as all the information comes out about him and his very weird and sometimes very shady financial dealings prior to this appointment and prior to his taking over as chief of staff with Jeff Sessions. Never take this administration's word for anything. From Daily Coast Radio. On NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the K Grow in the Morning Show with David Waltman. I mean that literally. Never take their word. And certainly when it comes to paperwork, don't even believe the paperwork exists until you've seen it and had it forensically tested for uh, to establish its genuineness. Anyway, plenty to catch up on on the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy next. Right here on Netroots Radio. Justice, take it away.